Welcome to Asthma Overview Part 1. Part 1 will include pathophysiology, signs and symptoms, and diagnostic tests. Part 2 will include treatments, drug therapy, nursing diagnosis, and nursing care. This is a standard disclaimer that basically says we do everything we can to give you accurate information. However, this information is not meant to substitute for your professor's instruction, but instead to supplement. The pathophysiology of asthma can be complex, but what occurs is a hyperreactivity to a stimulus. This then leads to bronchoconstriction, as you see on the right side of this, this diagram. And, and airway inflammation, and that constriction and inflammation stimulates increased mucus production, so, so that mucus further contributes to the obstruction of the airway. Risk factors and triggers are basically anything that can cause inflammation or irritation, and that includes allergens, but also you know, strong odors, smoke, cold air, all can irritate that the airway and, and cause that hyperreactivity to start. Stress and emotions can play a role and certainly genetics are key with asthma. So the signs and symptoms of asthma can be variable and predictable but I think you know the majority of these so we'll run through them quickly. An increased respiratory rate prolonged expiration. This is sometimes asked on tests and so a normal inspiratory expiratory ratio is 1 to 2 but in asthma that's oftentimes 1 to 3 or 1 to 4 where the expiration is much longer than it should be. Wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness, everybody knows. Cough. Cough um, you know about but sometimes they'll tell you that in the history that man he coughs every night and every morning and that history is suggestive of asthma. Retractions are the use of accessory muscles. Retractions is the term with kids, use of accessory muscles with adults, and nasal flaring. Both of those are signs that the, the patient is working hard to breathe. They need to use extra muscles. Their shoulders can be hunched up too. The next one you might not know that much about, and that's that inability to speak in complete sentences. So if the patient is having to take a breath between every sentence like that, that's a sign that uh, they're having difficulty breathing and working hard. Obviously, anxiety is very common. When you can't breathe, you get anxious. And when you get anxious, you tend to hyperventilate, that higher respiratory rate. And when you get that, you tend to get dizzy, and it makes you more anxious. You can certainly get hypoxic with asthma with their O2 sats decreased, and then that can lead to the dizziness, decreased level of consciousness, or even cyanosis. If you go to our website at pocketprofnursing.com, I have some videos on there that show actual retractions and nasal flaring and audible wheezing versus osculatory wheezing. And you can look at those and see what those look like and even count their respiratory rate on those patients to help you further understand. Now, I think we tend to get Get, do patients a disservice and we tell you the signs and symptoms we don't necessarily tell you how you know when they're getting worse which is really important to know so with asthma people typically think oh if they're wheezing that's a sign that it's a bad attack well that's not true and it's actually a, quite an unreliable sign of how bad an attack is and that's because you have to have air moving through the airways to hear wheezing and oftentimes the airways are so constricted in a severe attack that there's not air moving so they are breathing you can count the breaths but if you were to listen to their breath sounds you don't hear any and so as a new nurse or as a student you typically think oh man I, I must not be listening right if I can't hear any breath sounds so I'm sure they've got them well they may not have them because those airways may be so constricted we're not moving air so when you give them a bronchodilator, oftentimes that will open the airways enough that now they have very loud wheezing. And that's actually a good sign because now we're moving air. So wheezing is not the sign your patient's getting worse. It actually might be they're getting better. So let's look at what is. So serious changes that tell us the patient is working harder 
are those things that show increased work of breathing. Those use of accessory muscles, nasal flaring, inability to talk in complete sentences. Also, if the sat, the O2 saturations are dropping, that's not a good sign, obviously. And then in an adult, if their respiration rate is over 30, that's also a bad sign. Now, it depends on what stage they are in that, and certainly in kids, we can have a respiratory rate much higher than that. So that's not as important as those increased work of breathing symptoms. Ominous changes for everybody is if their heart rate drops and their respiratory rate drops. So most of the time students would say, oh, if their respiratory rate used to be 30 and now it's 16, that's good. But that's not good in asthmatic. That's often a sign that they are fatiguing. So what tends to happen is they hyperventilate, breathe really fast, they get hypoxic, they're working harder to breathe, and then everything slows down, and that's really fatigue and impending respiratory failure. So you need to be ready at that point to intubate, not ready to say your patient's better. And then the silent chest I talked about is not good, especially if you're giving bronchodilators and you continue to not hear breath sounds. That's a bad sign. So the lab and diagnostic testing that we do with typically with asthmatics are peak flow meter, pulmonary function testing, PFT, allergy testing, and chest x-ray. Now when they're having an acute attack, the peak flow and the PFT are really not helpful because the patient can't take deep enough breaths. So those top three tests are typically done afterwards, even on an outpatient basis, to help manage their treatment regularly. So peak flow is really, really important, but I'm going to cover that in detail in part two. Lots of test questions are asked about peak flow, so you do need to understand it. Uh, pulmonary function testing we use to to diagnose and evaluate asthma, and so it looks at lung capacity. And with all tests, it's really important that you know, is it going to be painful? Is there going to be any MPO status? And is there any rules before and after the test? So in this case, it's not painful. No need for sedation, so no need for MPO. Um, they will, though, have to restrict the use of bronchodilators and corticosteroids, usually the day before the test. Because what they want to do is have the patient come in, they're going to blow into that machine, as you kind of see in this picture, and they're going to get their lung capacity. Then they're going to give them a bronchodilator and have them do it again and see what changes in their lung capacity. Allergy testing, you know about the skin test. RAST is a blood test that's oftentimes done in small children who couldn't tolerate skin testing. Chest x-ray is sometimes done with acute attack, especially if we're not quite sure what caused it, because they want to make sure there's not a pneumonia or something infectious, although that's somewhat uncommon. But also, we don't want to confuse it with other things that look like asthma. For example, if they inhaled something, a foreign object, like they inhaled a coin or they tried to swallow a quarter, and it went into their lungs, that could cause some of the similar symptoms. Sputum cultures. There's no need to do sputum cultures generally in a patient with asthma. It's not usually an infectious process. So if you see in a test question which test is most commonly ordered for uh, asthma patients, it's not ever going to be sputum cultures. I encourage you to watch Asthma Treatment and Nursing Care Part 2, where we're going to review those asthma drugs and the nursing care and treatment. Also, check out our website, pocketprofnursing.com, and I will give you my notes for this uh, video, and I'll give you those videos to look, to look at signs and symptoms, and then some games to test your knowledge of asthma. And watch for more of our videos and even an app coming soon. As always, we appreciate your feedback so we can give you what it is you want. So suggest topics, ask questions in that comment section below, and write our videos. All you have to do is click like or dislike, share the video if you liked it, and then finally subscribe to our YouTube channel so you'll be the first to see our new videos. Thanks for watching.